Hello, everybody. I'm joining you live from Paris, and this is going to be a 45-minute introduction to philosophy and theory lecture series. If you're new here, this is a series that I started about two and a half years ago, and the goal was to make philosophy and theory more accessible, but also to really engage with the arts. So the fine arts, literature, poetry, theater, cinema, what have you. And for some background, I started doing this when I was still an educator at the University of Oxford Brooks. Back then it was just a small group of students, all of whom, whom I knew personally. And since then it's become a global community of like-minded thinkers and learners like yourself. And so if you'd like to join me for the next 45 minutes or so, you are absolutely welcome to stay a while. We are going to be continuing the discussion on form versus content with numerous examples. And if you're curious about other instances where I talked about Shakespeare and art theory, etc., you can find that in the previous lecture. And if time permitting, I'm going to try to end this lecture by talking a little bit about Hegel's theory of spirit and how he characterizes spirit. Um, I'm currently in Paris. I'm enjoying, enjoying it very much. I'm going to be here for another month or so. Um, so if you'd like to join me for this uh, lecture series, you can simply tune in every week. That is 5 p.m. Paris time, 8 a.m. USA PT. And of course, I see people joining us from around the world. Hello from Germany. It is so wonderful that you're here. Please do drop a comment letting me know where you're joining me from. It makes me very happy to see you all gathered here together, so to speak. And if you'd like to support this lecture, theory, uh, this lecture series, if you'd like to support my classes, please consider becoming a patron. It makes a huge difference. And as a patron, you can access audio downloads for all of my lectures, as well as my collected Guide to Zizek ebook series. I see Berlin, I see Ethiopia, hello, Croatia, Boston, hello, that's absolutely wonderful. It is so nice that you are joining us. I see New Jersey, hello, it's wonderful that you're here. Hello, UK, uh, it's so pleasant to be joined by people from around the world. Denmark, all right. Uh, it's a little bit warm because I'm shining a light in my face right now, which happens to be quite warm, but otherwise it is a rainy day here in lovely Paris. So today we're gonna to be continuing the discussion as to form versus content, which I introduced last week as being one of the most important conceptual ideas within both philosophy, going back to Plato's metaphysics and his system of metaphysics, which responded to the sophists and the pre-Socratics, but also a key component of understanding literary theory, understanding art theory, film theory, what have you. In fact, one of the key ideas within what we know as theory, which stems from all the post-metaphysical movements, all revolve around this idea, this problematization of form and content. In fact, last week I argued that one of the key aspects of modernism and then postmodernism is its relationship to the problem of form. And today I'm going to try to provide you with a couple more examples that will hopefully give you an idea of what we mean by form and content and how it can help you in your own studies and your own learning. I think it can be a really fruitful way of approaching key texts. Now, since we're in Paris, I thought it might be fun to start with one of the seminal Parisian texts, which is, of course, uh, Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time. And what's kind of interesting here, of course, Marcel Proust in Search for Lost Time, being sort of a pre-modernist work uh, par excellence, is all about the relationship between form, namely the manner in which we remember or recall the past, and the content of the lived past. And here's actually quite, I think, interesting to look at the difference between the two English translations of the title. Uh, the first most prominent translation, which is in fact erroneous and yet was the, the, the accepted one for a long time, is that it was supposed to be titled um, In Remembrance of Things Past. It's En Entendant les Temps Perdus was translated as In Remembrance of Things Past. And yet, strictly speaking, this doesn't really encapsulate the Proustian problem. After all, if you remember things that are in the past, strictly speaking, you're a nostalgic. You're simply remembering the good old days. You have no problem remembering them. You could go to a pub or a cafe and you could reminisce with your friends about how things were when you were young. The proper translation, which is today, of course, accepted, is no longer in remembrance of things past, 
but in search of lost time. And in search of lost time has a very different meaning if you think about it. After all, we can't really find time which has been lost. And at the same time, no pun intended, all time is imminently lost. Think about the way in which we conceptualize the present. The present is simply a fleeting passing moment between the future and what will immediately, incessantly become the past. It's almost impossible for us to really grasp a present moment because in its becoming, it is already fading away. Even the conceptualization of the future is already preying upon the present. And as the nostalgic or the melancholic knows, as soon as you think about the past, you have essentially paralyzed your future because you are stuck in it. Therefore, the very idea of thinking about the past, of trying to retrieve that which has passed you by, is doomed to fail and to become parasitic upon your future perspective. This is why the traditional definition, as I've said before, of the melancholic is the person who falls in love with his own loss, namely that which he can no longer regain. And what is the ultimate thing that you can't regain? It is the past. You can't live it again. So you can restage it in your mind. You can have various forms of trying to live in it, and yet in so doing, you deny yourself the possibility of a future. And so what's interesting is that within the two titles, the two English titles of Proust's masterpiece, namely Remembrance of Things Past and In Search of Lost Time, we already have two very different propositions about the relationship between form and content. In remembrance, or what the title Remembrance of Things Past implies, is a linear form in which we can simply access the past as a kind of library. We can think back to it pleasantly. In search of lost time implies that you are searching for something which by its very definition is lost or barred to you. In fact, the Proustian argument, if you will, is that all time is imminently lost. That time isn't something that can be properly grasped. If you even look at the first chapter of Proust's In Search of Lost Time, you will see this beautifully layered writing, which is not simply a metaphor, but a formal exercise in the futility of trying to grasp the passage of time. We have a, ch a child who reads, and this is a memory of the narrator as a child, a child who reads, and he reads before he goes to bed. And while he's reading, he enters a luminal state in which he cannot tell whether he is awake or already dreaming. And so we already have a blurring of the boundaries between consciousness and unconsciousness, between past and future. After all, when you fall asleep, the passage of time changes as well. And when you wake up, it feels like no time has passed at all, even if it might have been seven hours. And whilst this is occurring, whilst the memory of the narrator as a child is in the potential process of falling asleep. He is looking at a lamp in his children's bedroom, a lamp which is spinning. And while it spins, the light reflects a kind of carousel of images, essentially a metaphor for the moving image, the modernist medium par excellence, which would soon take over the very way in which people conceptualize their own life and desires and dreams and fantasies. And the remembrance of the narrator as a child in the process of falling asleep whilst reading gazes upon this lamp and sees images that are reflected upon the wall. In this multi-layered milfo of recollections, we have essentially a miniature form of Marcel Proust's proposition about time, which is that time can't be retrieved because it was never there in the first place. In fact, there's a beautiful passage in one of Proust's letters in which Proust, when he's Proust the writer, in which Proust writes about his childhood memories, reading. And he says, when he was a child, all he wanted to do was read. In fact, he didn't want to do anything that could distract him from his reading. So he didn't want to go outside and play, for example. He was a relatively sickly child. And so he couldn't simply join other children in sports. At the same time, he didn't want to be called back inside the house for dinner because he was so, uh, so focused on his reading, on these children's stories. And yet he says, ironically, he only really, when he thinks back to his childhood past, what he remembers most distinctly are all the things that were happening around him whilst he was reading. 
In other words, not the contents of the book, those don't seem to matter, but the surroundings, the wind, the sun, the leaves, the grass that he was sitting in while he was reading. In fact, he essentially proposes a distinctly contemporary psychological theory, which is that of the wandering mind, that whilst he was so focused and engaged on his reading, an unconscious element of his mind was wandering and taking everything in, and that therefore his memories of that place are vivid precisely because he was looking at them indirectly, that he remembers them because he was doing something else. And this is a beautiful quote about core memories you may have encountered, which is that you, re you think you're having fun, but really you're making memories, that memories are never, I did this thing, Memories are always the form in which you did them, which is a Proustian proposition, if you will, between form and content, that memories are not the content of the past, nor are they some kind of archival refraction of lived existence. Instead, it is the very form through which memories are made that constitute the content of reflection. And of course, as we live longer, our present and our future perspective becomes increasingly informed by these multiple layers of memories. In fact, the very idea that we have today between a false memory and a true memory would go against the Proustian argument, who essentially argues that all memories are false. But this isn't that they are not to be trusted. It's that subjectivity is misleading. Subjectivity is an illusion that we're constantly trying to navigate our path through myriad layers of misperception, not in order to achieve the truth, but to understand the truth of the form itself. And this is what makes Proust such a key figure in that he is making a transition from realist writing, roman à clef, essentially a, a thinly veiled uh, 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 realistic passages about his own time, and yet in so doing, in this almost satirical, realist content, the plot of the novel, he's making multiple formal arguments about the nature of time and subjectivity and recollection as well. And here we see one of the key characteristics of all modern art, be it modern literature, modern theater, modern poetry, even the emergence of modern film, by which I mean the emergence of the refraction of time through editing that cuts indicate temporal illusions, if you will, or refractions, is this play with form. That, to put it technically, that the form becomes its own content. And this is an, a quite novel thing, if you will. Now, of course, in previous times, before modernism, we also have instances in which this happens. For example, look at Wagner. Wagner, one of the greatest, uh, uh, not just greatest uh, uh, writers of opera, but also dramaturgs, Wagner uses imagery and music and the famous leitmotif, which I can explain in a moment, to undermine the content, but also to facilitate it. Let me give you an example. One of the most beautiful and dramatic pieces of music ever written is the climactic ending of Tristan and Isolde, the famous Liebes Tod, which if you translate it literally translates into love death, in which we have Isolde at the beach with the waves coming in, in a kind of deep ecstatic grief, a kind of high and low subsequently, both the pinnacle of her life, but of course also the moment of death. It's the moment of everything and nothing, if you will. It's this, uh, this, this, this uh, climactic universal collision of sound and music and sensations. It's very beautiful. It's deeply moving. In fact, if you listen to it online, you will most likely feel that you have an almost physical experience listening to it, that it can send shivers down your, your entire body. In fact, when the music was performed, it was notorious because many people in the audience would pass out. And while it's easy today to uh, pretend that that was something that affected people who were simply understimulated, if you go to a performance of it today and you sit close enough to the orchestra, uh, I, I, I dare you not to feel uh, an, an intense rush from the experience, the sonorous experience of that. Anyway, what's key here on, on many levels is the idea of the waves. It's the idea of the waves coming in, the waves coming in onto the body of Trisan. And the music, of course, follows, 
in a pre-modern sense, essentially the figurative drive of the whales, of the, not the whales, excuse me, of the waves crashing down. You can feel the music flowing and swelling and ebbing and, and trying to reach something which can never be reached. Of course, this is what the ocean does. If you look at the waves, you will see that there is no final moment of completion. It's the very moment in which the wave bursts if you will, its banks, it is also pulled back. It's a beautiful image of self-relating negativity. It is no accident that Hegel, in his characterization of spirit, refers to it as Meereschaum, as the frothing on the waves, something which is generated through the self-relating negative impulse of the thrashing waves. And it's interesting because it's as close as Hegel really comes to a romantic image. Keep in mind that Hegel really disliked the romantics, that he uh, not just disliked them personally, uh, many of them had been friends of his, but that he disliked this idea of the universalization of nature. He accused the romantics of having been thinkers who declared that all cows were black at night, which is a play upon the Spanish proverb that at, at night all cats are black that essentially their universalization of nature into a kind of sublime romantic idea had departicularized the world and left no role for the subject, which I'll return to later in this lecture in relationship to the Kantian categorical imperative, which Hegel characterized as a pure, uh, empty formalism. But I'll put that aside for now. The point here is that when Hegel uses this romantic image of the wave crashing down, he's actually making an anti-romantic argument. He's not saying that the wave represents some kind of universal divine will, that it is the sublime manifestation of impenetrable nature. Instead, Hegel's essentially positing that within the movement of a wave, we find the self-relating negativity of subjectivity, of something which cannot find itself, which has no true beginning and no end. Of course, a life has the beginning of being born and it has the ending of dying, but within this temporal limitation, there is no point at which you feel truly grounded, at which you truly feel like you can grasp yourself, which of course for Hegel was the highest form of knowing. And this self-relating negativity, which for Proust, of course, is the self-relating negativity of time, which is imminently already, always already, in fact, lost in the present, namely, it is the temporal cessation of the future into the past. This is the key constitutive feature of all subjectivity for Hegel, and therefore becomes the constitutive feature of nature. And what's fascinating here is that Hegel therefore makes the argument that subjectivity is not that which is thrashed by the waves, but that the truth of subjectivity lies within the movement of the wave, something excessive which emerges seemingly by itself on top, namely the foam on top of the wave. That is subjectivity, that is spirit. And importantly, here we can contrast this with Hegel's other metaphor for spirit. In fact, this is a very dramatic one and a, a, a counter-romantic one, if you will, to, 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 uh, to stress that, which is that Hegel characterizes spirit as nature's wound, the wound of nature. It's a very dramatic image of man who is irreconcilably outside of nature, who's, as Aristotle put it, whose true nature is found when he exits nature and finds himself in human community, in the socio-symbolic space of human interactions and the institutions that govern it and the morality that is necessitated to guide it. Hegel is here once again very Aristotelian, which if you followed this lecture series, and thank you if you have, you will find in one of the earlier lectures where I stress the relationship between Hegel and Aristotle. And so Hegel has these two metaphors for spirit or geist. One is the wound of nature, which I find very beautiful, and we could talk about perhaps another time in, a, in another lecture. And then the idea of the foam upon the sea. And this is where Hegel is also being a little bit cheeky, because after all, the foam on top of the sea is a libidinal image. It's, it's, uh, it's an almost pornographic image, if you will, of a kind of excessive scum-like something that is cast out through this explosive orgastic movement of the wave. And now we're back, of course, at Wagner's Liebestod, that this image of the wave 
is this image of excess, this image of self-relating negativity, of subjectivity, of something which is therefore libes tot. It is love death. Of course, love death is a tacit, perhaps not reference, but we can certainly make a link to the French uh, uh, word, for, uh, or at least the French, if you will, characterization of orgasm as a petit mort, as a little death. Liebes tot being therefore a kind of wink wink reference to the moment of subjective death when one immerses oneself in the other both literally and figuratively in the moment of orgasm one loses oneself and finds oneself and in the culminative moment of Liebes tot, whether you are in the audience listening to it or if it's the formal gesture of two characters finding themselves in death, we have restaged this motif of life and death, of feeling most present at the moment that you are most lost. In fact, in the moment of that all your subjectivity fades away, like when you're listening to the music and your body is taken over by this incredible sensation that you are no longer there, you are not present. And yet this moment is what it means to be truly alive, what it means to be truly subjective. There's a great line in um, the, I was rewatching the Barbie movie, and there's a great line in the Barbie movie where Barbie is overwhelmed by the contradictory emotions she is exposed to in the real world. She's sitting on a park bench Margot Robbie playing Barbie, and she sees people happy, she sees them sad, she sees people fighting and crying in despair and having the best day of their life. And this overwhelming contradiction of emotions makes herself feel something, makes herself cry. It's not merely empathy, I feel for you, it's I feel for feeling itself. And at that moment, it's very beautifully written, Margot Robbie as Barbie says, I felt something achy, but it felt good. And this, of course, is the complexity and the paradoxical nature of subjectivity that we find in Proust as well. When you think of the past, it hurts, it aches, but it also feels good. How can something that aches also provide you with pleasure? How can something that represents death represent life? How can something that is supposed to be eternal also be distinctly finite? This overlapping of the wave that thrashes down and is pulled away at the same time is the truth of subjectivity. Hence why subjectivity is nature's wound. It is nature's wound in that it is the wound which heals itself, which closes itself. Hence Wagner's Christian motif, um, in a, a, a not interest in his old, of die Wunde heilt nur der Speer, der sie schlug, Parsifal. The wound is healed only by the very lance that smote it. This opening and closing, the self-relating negativity of subjectivity, is therefore not just the truth of the subject. It is the truth of the universal principle, namely of Geist as well. Therefore, subjectivity becomes the truth of spirit, inasmuch as spirit is the truth of subject, hence a dialectical movement. Now again, this is very abstract. This is Hegelian metaphysical theory, but at the same time, we can find it in Proust. We can find it in Wagner. And the way that we can make these connections is by understanding the relationship between form and content. So let's briefly reiterate, in case you missed last week's lecture, the relationship between form and content. Content is what something is. For example, if you look at a painting, the painting represents something that is the content. If you look at a photograph, it is a photograph of something or somebody that is the content. The form, however, can be numerous things. The form can be the manner in which the content is depicted. For example, think about the difference between a black and white photograph and a color photograph and the quote unquote seriousness which a black and white photograph would suggest, the great sort of joke about, you know things happen in the past if they're in black and white. Here we have a form which has a tacit content of its own, which is a system of meaning that we associate with the form, which is that of the choice of color. But it is also the form of where it is hung. Is it hung in a gallery or is it posted on Instagram? 
If it's hung in a gallery, suddenly we attribute it with a certain amount of seriousness, which itself should lead us to question and critique the idea as to the constitutive power of the form of the gallery and the powers that be that it represents, namely the idea of art as a commercial entity, art as a commodity, and the gallery something which gives it the importance and credibility, which therefore lends it its value. This is part of the form of art, not just the form of framing the picture, but the form of where it is posted. The famous expression from Marshall McLuhan, the title of his book, The Medium is the Message, is an argument about form versus content, that the form through which the content is transmitted is itself something which has content. Think about it in terms of the algorithm. In fact, I think everybody understands form versus content today because the algorithm is a formal mechanism. In other words, it creates an art, a, 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 a sequence of decisions about what content to send out to people and the formal restrictions placed upon this content. Is it 60 seconds? Do people watch more than five seconds of the video? Is it hashtag dogs or hashtag cats? Will influence who receives that content, but more importantly, it will influence the manner in which the content is made. And while the algorithm is not a strict system of censorship, although there are certain elements thereof, like calling dead unalive, which is also how the content is impacted by the form, while these restrictions are not always as strict as those, people will begin to make content in a certain manner, knowing that the algorithm will promote it and send it to more people. But this isn't just the algorithm. Think about the radio. When people write music in a certain way, that it will be playable on the radio and therefore have more universal appeal and commercial value, there is a formal mechanism at play that prioritizes certain modes of cultural and artistic production and deprioritizes others. It becomes very difficult to make quote unquote original niche, less accessible art or music or photography or anything because the algorithm or the radio before it or the television channels want it to be a universal commodity, something which will appeal to as many people as possible. In fact, the algorithm fears the following and it punishes creators by saying, if you make something that doesn't have universal appeal, let's say that you make a video about your interest in Hegel, the algorithm will nevertheless send it to people who don't know about Hegel. And how do people respond when they don't know about something? They tend to get angry because nobody likes to feel like they don't know something. And so the creator making a video about Hegel, tacit reference to myself and my own experience, will therefore be punished by an audience who feels they are being given something which they do not like. Here again, the form, the algorithm, shapes the manner in which the content is framed and received, but also the manner in which then the relationship between the idea of the recipient of said content and the content creator takes place. And so if we take Roland Barthes' famous exclamation about the death of the author, we could apply it today to the idea of the death of the content creator, or if you will, the death of the artist, the death of the musician, the death of... Uh, 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 the death of anyone trying to create something. And whilst Roland Barthes wasn't writing about the fact that one could no longer create meaningful literature, etc., instead he was writing about the exchange that takes place through the form of the reception of re readership itself, which is a fancy way of saying that as soon as you write something, it no longer belongs to you. You have given it to the audience which means that, strictly speaking, the death of the author takes place at the exact moment that the audience receives the work of literature, that the act of reading therefore constitutes the elimination of authorial intent. Also, why, for Roland Barthes, it's so important that we don't try to recover authorial intent, which was a classic mode of reading literature up until the 1960s, but that instead we do either a historicist or a deconstructionist reading of the hidden modes that were within the production and the power constructs, if you want to put it in those terms, of the work itself. In other words, the production of the text mirrors the production of the reader, which therefore comes at the cost of the production of the author, hence the death of the author. Once again, this is the content that lies within the form itself, hence why literary theory can be encapsulated in the simple formula of placing emphasis on the content in the form of literary transmission rather than the form of the content and the author's supposed intent. Now, 
Again, I'm trying to make linkages here. You can probably understand that this is also happening in Proust. Barth may declare the death of the author, but Proust, in a sense, declares the death of the subject. That the modern subject is a subject who no longer can recollect where he's from and what he's supposed to do in life. Kafka is the ultimate modernist. Kafka takes Proust and radicalizes him. After all, when Gregor Samsa wakes up in the beginning of Metamorphosis and finds himself to be an Ungezifa, something which is not really a bug, it's simply a, a kind of something indeterminate, often represented as a beetle, this is modern subjectivity. A sense of being lost, a sense of not knowing what the horizons of meaning in the symbolic order are, or not wanting to find yourself in them. I'll give you another example of the relationship between form and content. Let's go back to another seminal realist work that contains within it the beginnings of modernism, Thomas Mann's Buddenbrooks. Thomas Mann, recipient of the uh, Nobel Prize uh, literature for this very book. In the Buddenbrooks, we have a classic uh, choice, classic literary plotline, if you will, which is that we have a wealthy family, bourgeois family, who have a daughter, and this daughter has to be married. And the question, the problem is, who will she be married to? Will she be married to another wealthy businessman? Will she therefore continue the lineage of her family? Or will she choose to marry out of love? Will she choose to, rem to marry someone who is potentially lower than her in social standing? Traditional, if you will, plot line problem. Now, Tony, as she's called in this book, is uh, asked to be married. Uh, someone uh, asks for her hand, who is uh, known as Herr Grünlich, who is, in her eyes, a vulgar businessman who simply says things to flatter people, to be seen in a good light. She can't stand him. She finds him repulsive. The man she falls in love with, on the other hand, is a young student from the German town of Göttingen, one of the old university towns, together with Freiburg and Heidelberg. And Göttingen, the student in Göttingen, is a student of medicine. So he's not poor, exactly. He's an aspiring, if you will, uh, working-class student who wishes to become part of the middle class, part of the intelligentsia. And he tells her that he does not believe in the idea of aristocrats, that he finds aristocrats to be vulgar. And her response, of course, is beautifully contemporary. Her response is, well, have you ever met one? And then he says, it's not that I don't like aristocrats personally. It's not that they've done something to me personally. It's that I reject them in principle, which again is important. He's essentially saying, I make the argument against aristocrats universally, not particularly. This mirrors Saint Just's famous argument following the French Revolution when he said that the point was not to put the king on trial to determine whether or not he was a good king, but to put the very idea of monarchy on trial itself. In other words, to reject monarchy in principle, not to determine whether one king was deserving of being king or not. This is the argument that the young man makes, which he finds so interesting. It's not about whether she likes individual members of the aristocracy. It's about rejecting the principle of aristocracy itself. Now, we'll return to the Buddenbrooks in a moment, but here it's actually quite interesting to look at Hegel's critique of Kant's categorical imperative, which follows a similar argument. Kant's categorical imperative, which you may have heard before, is usually taught like this. It's a simplification, but it's usually taught like this you should essentially only act if your action could be considered a universal principle. So, for example, if you do something, you should imagine that everybody would do it, and if the world would still function, and it would be a world you would like to live in, then it is an action in accordance with virtue. You should do it. Hegel has a beautiful response to this. Of course, it's complicated, but the simple critique that Hegel makes of Kant is that he says, how does this work? It's not just the counterfactual. He says, how would this work with theft? Imagine theft, right? If everybody would steal, then clearly this would not be a world that you would want to live in, in which everyone is stealing from, from each other. And yet what Hegel is really arguing here is that theft 
already implies the idea of property as a universal right. After all, you can only steal that which someone else has. But as soon as you've stolen it, strictly speaking, it becomes your property. Or does it not? Hegel essentially argues that if you steal something, it is therefore no longer property. This means that as soon as you steal it, you have changed the essence of the character of property. And of course, here you can understand the Hegelian element in the Proudhonian argument, which will later become a key slogan for Marxists around the world. All property equals theft. That if theft is supposed to be a morally bad thing, which Kant therefore argues should not be a universalizable action, then what constitutes property? Why is property an a priori for Kant? Why does Kant think, simply think that property is something one has? How do you end up with a house if you've inherited it, or if you've taken out a loan from a bank, or if you had to work hard to save up in order to show your credit rating to have the loan from said bank? In other words, the very idea of property already has multiple layers of socio-symbolic foundations built into it, things that you take for granted, certain assumptions about man's natural rights, the inequities that we find tolerable. And therefore, the moralization of the idea of theft belies the problem that Kant does not accept, that property is, in a sense, already theft, something which has been taken from someone else, except, of course, we use various ways to cement that bond. For example, the transaction of money. I'm not stealing it from you. I'm giving you money so that you feel like you have something in return, etc. And so Kant is accused by Hegel. Hegel makes this very clear. Hegel accuses Kant of an empty formalism. And what he means by this empty formalism is that he's created a formal paradox between the idea of property and universalized theft, which would therefore not be accessible for Kant, but he obscures the content of property and how property becomes thus in the first place. Hence, the Proudhonian left Hegelian radicalization is therefore to apply the Kantian universalization back upon the content of property itself, and therefore to argue that all property equals theft. Hegel then plays various games with this, essentially saying all, all laws are universalized crimes. In other words, crime wouldn't exist without law. Think about the power of prohibition. If somebody tells you you can't do something, then you're probably going to want to do it. In other words, the very prohibition creates the desire to then go against said prohibition. In other words, the very idea of prohibition is an emanation of the idea, sorry, the very idea of sin or crime is an emanation of the prohibition itself. In other words, it becomes a prohibition against prohibition. And this entire universe that Kant therefore creates for Hegel is essentially false. It's formal because it implies that there is an a priori an sich value to the idea of what it means to act in accordance with virtue. Now, let's go back to the Buddenbrooks for a moment. Remember, Tony finds this young student who introduces this philosophical idea to her, which is, of course, also a political one in his implications, when he says that I don't reject the aristocracy personally. It's not that I find them distasteful or they've done something bad or I spoke to an aristocrat who wasn't very nice. It's I reject them in principle. Essentially, the argument that Tony is making here is that the aristocracy is taken for granted. It's like the property for Kant. It's supposed to be the universal foundation upon which society is built. And hence, every other class exists only so as to retroactively ratify and legitimize the existence of the aristocracy. Let's go back to Proust for a moment. There's a beautiful scene about this in Proust where there's a woman who's not part of the aristocracy, but she's part of the upper middle class. So she's a little bit lower. And what she does is that whenever somebody marries up, instead of being jealous of that person, she pities the upper class person for marrying down. In other words, she says, nobody can ascend to the upper classes. They can simply descend. And therefore, she has replaced envy with pity. Therefore, she is perfectly content in her middle class existence because the aristocrats remain above her and nobody can become aristocratic. The aristocrats can simply descend down. And this is, of course, constitutive for every idea of hierarchy and social class. It's the idea that a lot of the class values of the quote-unquote upper crust are protected by the very people who do not partake in it who are not participants in it, but facilitators. 
This is a classic satirical motif going back to medieval plays and Commedia della Arte, which is that the person who guards the civic moral structures and the etiquette of the upper classes most closely tend to be the servants of the upper classes. That it's the servants who insist upon the correct code of address, etc., and that it's not the upper classes. Of course, the argument, to go back to Buddenbrooks and apologies for darting around literary landscapes here, in the Buddenbrooks, Tony's argument is therefore that his class shouldn't matter, that she should be able to marry him. She should be able to marry whoever she loves because love is a subjective experience. And it's up to you to make your own life and to make your own happiness. And if what makes her happy is to be with him, they should be together. He doesn't put it in these terms, but clearly this is how it appears. However, and this is where Buddenbrooks is very beautiful because it's not a moralizing tale. Ultimately, spoilers for Buddenbrooks, Tony doesn't marry this young student. In fact, she writes to her father and says, I found this young student who I love and I would like to marry him. And the father, in no uncertain terms, essentially writes that he will disown her, that she is betraying the, fam the family, that everyone has sacrificed in order to protect the family name and to continue the family business and to preserve it for the next generation, and that if she chooses to place herself above her family, in other words, to choose her own happiness above the family's happiness, the content of her own subjective experience upon the form, the formal structure of heritage and lineage, she is therefore, by definition, not of the family, that she is already an outcast. And what's beautifully cruel here is that the father doesn't say, I disown you, which would be too simple. He essentially says, you will disown yourself. You will have made yourself not a member of this family. You have been the weakest link. He uses the metaphor of a chain. And he then ends his letter to her by saying, I love you very much. Your mother can't wait to see you. We all look forward to holding you in our, in your, in our arms and your brothers and sisters uh, uh, look forward to spending time with you when you're back. In other words, he's not threatening her in as many words. He's essentially making an argument about the content, which is the content of the form of the family apropos the subjective individual content, which is that of her own happiness, which is another way of arguing that he is saying that she has to place her duty, her familial duties, above the responsibilities which she finds that she has towards her own happiness. Now, what's interesting here, I wanna, sorry that I'm still on Buddenbrooks. What happens following that is that she goes home and she sees in the study of her father a big book. You know, you, you could imagine Trump saying, it's the biggest book with the best leather, etc. A big family book in which all the names of the family members have been written and all the important dates, like who was married to whom, etc. And she sees the book. And at this point, Thomas Mann writes this very beautifully, she becomes filled with a sense of her own importance. In other words, she likes the idea of being a link in this chain, something bigger than herself. She likes the idea of duty, which is simple, as opposed to love, which is messy. And she takes the pen, it's a big feather, one of those writing plumes, and she writes in the family book, which is already a subjective assertion of her independence as, as it is usually the father who does the writing. She writes in the family book, on this day I accepted the marriage proposal of Herr Grünlich. She's therefore accepted her role in the ranks of the family. Hence again, why Thomas Mann is not moralizing on behalf of romanticized subjectivity, marry for love, nor is he moralizing on behalf of familial duty. He is showing the complexity of what it means to be stuck in between. After all, the content of romantic love is placed as an ideal, and the reality of the form of familial loyalty is reconciled there as a discovery of self. In other words, when she falls in love with the student, she discovers another world. When she falls in love with her own duty, she discovers herself. That's the very paradoxical argument that Thomas Mann is making. Of course, he's not endorsing this. Let, let's remember that this is the decline and fall of a famous wealthy family. This is a foreshadowing of worse things to come at this point. Now, 
I want to wrap up here a little bit, but there's a couple of things that I'd like to still say. This context of familial duty, in other words, the form of the family, the content that lies within the form of family itself, is a key component of what Marxists would call bourgeois ideology. In other words, the idea of having a duty to something higher than yourself is contrasted with a kind of reckless selfishness of subjective romanticism. And it's very important here that the student she falls in love with is a student at the University of Göttingen who is interested in science, but also in romanticism. That he is someone who is emphasizing subjective individual passions, whereas the family is guaranteed as the opposite of that, something that you can lay aside the messiness of your individual subjective passions and embrace the idea of family. Now, the idea of bourgeois ideology is it is the framework which gives legitimacy to the form of capitalism and the exploitation innate to the form of capitalism as having content. In other words, that there is content within the idea of bourgeois participation in this very mercantile sense. Another beautiful example from Buddenbrooks, the characters often refer to marriage and love with mercantile expressions, like there's more fish in the sea, etc. There's many ways in which mercantile expressions, essentially bourgeois ideology, filter, in, filter into our everyday language. They're there in plain sight, but we wouldn't even assume them. For example, if you're, if you're writing, if you're talking with someone about your deliverables, the very word deliverable is already a bourgeois notion of producing a commodity which therefore has to be delivered to a recipient at a certain date. Think about the idea of a deadline, which we use universally for writing or self-imposed rules. The idea of a deadline is a bourgeois notion about having to finish a project or a commodity so that it can be sold on the market. This very way in which we infuse the notion of subjectivity and our life world experiences with a kind of formal structure which is facilitated by linguistic expressions, in other words, rhetoric, is therefore also part of bourgeois ideology. So one of the things that I like about being in Paris and being in France is that there's a, an awareness of this, that, that to be bourgeois is often something that people accuse each other of. To, for example, the idea of uh, uh, you know, if someone says, well, I'm getting married, they'll say that's horribly bourgeois of you. And of course, the irony today in a postmodern world is that it's terribly bourgeois to accuse people of being bourgeois. And this is not a critique of class. It's an awareness of the content that lies in the formal structures of social participation that are necessitated by the bourgeoisie to uphold the sense of legitimacy that comes with their economic exploits. However, the Marxist argument is to simply invert this, to say that the market represents itself as legitimate by means of retroactively being legitimized by these families, which I haven't expressed very well, but essentially what it means is that the production of subjectivity is the self-reproduction of the market system. That the very mechanism by which the capitalist consumer society and market follows its, its sort of perpetual fluctuating forces therefore reproduces the sense of innate legitimacy that people find within their ordinary lives, the universalization of which is, of course, the family, because who is not part of a family? Very few people. If you go all the way back to the Bible and you see uh, Jesus' expression that to love him you have to hate your family, we can find here an avant la lettre notion of this. Hating one's family, of course, doesn't appear to be something that one should do to be a good Christian. And yet the family is the structure of familial obligation. And therefore the resistance is the resistance against the family. Of course, the contemporary ideological emanation of this is Fast and the Furious series in which the invocation of family is so monotonous that at a certain point it means nothing at all. And yet family is, of course, important. Family is that which gives us a certain sense of who we are, who we understand, who people were before us. It's about passing on certain ideas, certain ways of being. Family therefore represents the very Proustian problem, which is that whether you like it or not, you are a product of your family. To put it in bourgeois terms, you are a product. Therefore, for Proust to be a member of a family is to be caught in the impossible position of wanting to be both like them, but also wanting to differentiate yourself against them. 
we're back again at a Freudian problematic, which is that you identify by means of acting against the name of the father. The name of the father is not the literal name of your father. It's not the father telling you that he has authority. It is the, in, the imbibed, symbolized authority of the father to whom you perform your life. Therefore, father doesn't have to be the father figure in spay. It could be the very idea of some authority that you feel that you are subject to. Once again, we're back at the question, why do we do things? For whom do we do them? What's the performative element of them? Which means that we are back at the idea of duty. And Kant's argument, essentially, is that duty, to be properly virtuous, is something which has to be pure form. It has to be something which can be completely universalized. Hegel's argument, apropos of this, is to say we have to go back to the content, the content of what this form represents, that the dream of a pure form of duty is the dream of something that doesn't exist. The idea of the family, the idea of the family chain, the idea of responsibility to God, the idea of responsibility to yourself, which of course is the duty of the romantic, all of these things are empty symbols through which we access subjectivity from which we are barred. And Hegel says that we have to know the content that lies within this form in order to know ourself. And Hegel's argument is, of course, that the content within the form is the true content of Geist itself. In other words, Kant's proverbial pure reason. And I know that this is a little bit technical, and I apologize for that. Hopefully it will also bring to mind ideas from previous lectures, which is, which is my goal here. Fundamentally, the argument is therefore this. Form versus content is itself a formalist proposition. The idea that form and content can be separated is itself a formal idea because it creates a structure, a binary between form and content. And what makes Hegel a post-metaphysical thinker and the vital insight of all theories be it Marxist theory, or literary theory, or film theory, or, or gender theory, or racial theory, or postmodern theory, or what have you, capital T theory, is precisely this problematization, this inquiry into the content of the form. And ultimately what I've tried to do here is to imply that there is content to the form of content versus form itself. And to end here, but you can find this in the previous lecture as well. This is to my mind why it's so interesting to read more, to read literature, to listen to music, to go back to poetry, because you discover that every artistic endeavor is not simply about self-expression, but it's about the constant reiterative process of separating form from content and finding content within form, which reiterates a theological and metaphysical problem that goes back to the dawn of humanity itself. I was recently, I know I'm going along here, I was recently at a concert of Schubert Leader, and there's a beautiful moment that is distinctly Proustian, in which the young protagonist of these Leader, Leader are, are, are like German songs, essentially, usually accompanied by the piano. And they tend to be romantic and very fatalistic and full of pathos. And here we have a young man who is in love with a woman who does not love him back, unrequited love. And he ha it's in the midst of winter, which of course represents the winter of his heart. It's the midst of winter and he falls asleep and he dreams of spring. And as he dreams of spring, the music takes on a more upbeat tempo. And then he wakes up and he wakes up back into winter. And yet, when he thinks back to his dream, he realizes that in his dream, he was dreaming of his love, and his heart begins to beat faster. And within this beating of his heart, in other words, the recollection of his dream, the music picks up as well. And the form of the music therefore mirrors the content of his beating heart, which is a pitter-patter, an unregulated rhythm. And in this waking moment, winter is therefore no longer winter because winter has been pierced by spring. Spring itself being a metaphor for his love for the woman. 
which is another way in which the content lies within the very form. In other words, the mirroring of the dream, which resembles the unrequited longing, which therefore makes his heart beat faster. And you, as audience listening to this song, will probably feel similar emotions by means of listening to the music. And therefore, we have engaged in a distinctly subjective exchange of experiences, which is that it can't be accessed directly. Everything is a dream. Life is a dream. Time is a dream. Poetry is the fiction that tells the truth. Art is the lie which speaks truth. And we can find said truth in those books, in the music, in the poetry. It's not as simple as simply, does she love me, does she love me not? And so the Proustian problem, which I introduced as modern, was already there in its becoming. And once you understand this relationship between form and content, you can see the entire trajectory of the history of artistic production come into being. You can start tracing all the connections. We didn't have time for it here. I can talk about it in the Q&A, but the Wagnerian light motif, which is his central innovation in, in, in music, is something that Adorno hated because he thought it was part of the commoditization of music. And yet when you go back to Wagner, you see that the light motif undermines the dramaturgical features. In other words, that it comes at the wrong moment or it comes too late. Form and content, as I argued last week, is the beating heart of artistic expression. It is something that lies at the core of every single work of art, even if you don't see it. And so if you understand the tension between form and content, so much of art, art will become really rich and exciting to you. At least that's my hope. And I've done as much as I can here in an hour to hopefully instill that inspiration in you because I don't wish to inspire, but I wish to instill a sense of legitimacy to give you the audacity to study and to learn and to dream and to see your own self as a part of this bigger expression of monumental transhistorical ideas, which is a fancy way of saying, keep dreaming, keep writing, keep learning, keep reading, keep listening, keep creating, keep being. To go back to the Barbie movie, which I recently re-saw, at the end of the movie, Barbie makes a choice it's a decision. She says, I don't want to be an idea. I want to be someone who creates ideas. That realization is the realization of form and content. I don't want to be the content. I want to be the one who participates in the form through which the content is created. And so be someone who is not just the recipient of ideas. Be someone who swims in them, who creates them, who contributes to them. Choose not to be an idea. Choose to be someone who creates and ultimately someone who creates yourself. Thank you guys so much for listening. I love that you joined me here today on Monday. It's such a pleasure to host these sessions. I'm gonna host a Q&A on Patreon, which I also post as a members only podcast. It's like a seminar essentially. If you'd like to download that, as well as my eBooks and my transcripts and audio downloads, and if you'd just like to be part of our learning community, head over to Patreon. It really helps me keep these lectures open access and free for everybody around the world. The link is www.patreon.com forward slash Julian Philosophy. Thank you so much, and I will see you next week.